Hello everybody, hello world, how are you? It's me again, Ken Simmons. Area 58 presents the shortest 30 minutes on television. The Ken Simmons Show. Glad you're here because if you weren't here, there'd be no need for me. We've got a guest today and he's a very interesting guy. He's a very informative guy. He's a very, very good guest. And I will get to him in just a minute, but you know, I, I look in the paper, I look on the TV, I look around, I, I want to bring you something in these shows because I only do it once a week. Uh, something cheerful, something nice, something good. I can't find anything. Everything is so bad out there. So let me go back in time again. Remember, I'm a walking history book. So I'm so old. Uh, we, we go back now to uh, the 1945 or 46. I was about 14 or 15 years old in high school. I had four of my, three of my friends, there were four of us, uh, about, still are buddies, by the way, 75 years later, 70 years later. Um, one of them has passed away, he was my best man. But I want to tell you about the chief of police in the town of Randolph. His name was Pat McDonald. He's a legend in the town of Randolph. He was the only police officer in the town of Randolph, and he happened to be the chief, the big guy. And he had a, a disease in his nose. His nose was rather bulbous, and he was very conscious of that. You better not stare at his nose, because like Cyrano de Bergerac, he would challenge you to a duel. Now, he was a big guy, but he was a good cop. He was a very good cop. Town of Randolph had a main street. It was about maybe 125 yards long, and at the top, the hill, there was a rotary. We used to call it a dummy cop, but we, we, uh, we, we gave up that word dummy cop because I got in too much trouble with it. Anyway, um, the four of us are sitting on a wall in front of a doctor's office on the main street. And we're talking, probably smoking cigarettes. We're big shots, we're men of the world. We're in high school. And uh, along came Pat McDonald on his motorcycle. He was in full uniform and he got off and he came over and he said, hi boys, how are you? We answered in the affirmative. He said, uh, I'm getting complaints. Uh, some women want to go in the doctor's office and you're sitting there and they feel funny going by you. So I'm going to ride my bike up to the square here and turn around and when I come back, you're going to be gone. Well, he got on his bike and we muttered to each other that we weren't going to put up with anything like that. It's a free country and we have our liberty and we have our civil rights. Uh, he turned around and he came back and he said, I see you're still here. Well, he got off his bike again. I mean, well, now this guy's a big guy. And he said, Simmons, he was a friend of my father, so he knew me first. Stand up. And I stood up and he spun me around and he gave me a boot in the rear end in the gluteus maximus that I can feel to this day. And w with that, all my friends absconded. They took off in different directions. <laughs> and I went home and I told my father what the chief of police had done to me. And he said, what did you do to deserve that? And I told him, he said, stand up. <laughs> you know the rest. And that's a true story, by the way. Uh, all right, I'm going to bring you uh, my guest. I want to introduce him to you right now because I don't want to waste a lot of time with my palaver. So stick around, take off your shoes, pour yourself your favorite beverage. I'll be right back. Okay, we're back and happy to be. I want you to meet my guest for today. He's the chief of police of the town of Carver. Ken, Thank good you. to see you. How good morning. You? Good to see you. Good to see you. You know, you do me an honor. You honor my show with your office. Oh, thank Very you. nice to have the chief of police sit here and answer my stupid questions to the best of his ability. And I was thinking last night, I had some questions. I prepare my show when I go to bed at night. I was thinking to myself, 
I'm going to ask him this, I'm going to ask him that. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, that calls for an opinion. And I don't really think you should express an opinion. I think we should stick to dogma. Sure. Whatever is police work is mm -hmm. police work. And those are the questions that you should be asked. I, I want to get off that just for a, a couple of minutes here. I am so disgusted with a guy by the name of Harvey Weinstein. I know this is not a police matter. Well, it is a police matter, of course, but he makes me ashamed to be a man. Well, he's, uh, it certainly is an interesting time that we live in, and um, what he's bringing to what's coming to light now about his actions, certainly uh, I can agree with you on that statement. Well, somebody called him a womanizer. He's way beyond that. Mm -hmm. He's way beyond a womanizer. Mm -hmm. But you know what bothers me? As you know, I was a hairdresser. I didn't know that, actually. But Most of my adult okay. life, I was a hairstylist. Sure. I didn't do men. Mm -hmm. In those days, you did men or women. If you did men, you were a barber. Mm -hmm. I was a hairstylist. And I did people like Ava Gabor, if you've ever heard oh, of her. Yeah. Sure. Worked with her, and Linda Darnell, and Shaka Khan, oh, okay. and Natalie Cole. I didn't, I didn't know that about you. Ken. Yeah, I had, and I traveled, not the world, but uh, four or five of the major countries, France, Germany, Japan, uh, Korea, Korea, by the way. Uh, and when you, when you do hundreds of women, you you become almost like buddy buddy. You know, it's not it's not the male female thing in that case. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it, it's a it's a definite friendship. It's a definite kind of bonding. Uh, I hope I'm explaining that right because what I'm about to say is I'm in a different world now. I women. You, I I don't know how to speak to women anymore. I. What, what constitutes harassment? I don't expect you to answer that question, but I would like to have in here a woman and a man or two women or whatever, or some kind of a little panel to show me how I should interact with women now. Somebody said to me, today you interact with women like you do with your buddies, your men, male buddies. I said, no, that's not true. I say things in front of the guys I would never say in front of a woman. And uh, if a guy does something great, I probably hit him on the rear end. I would never do that to a woman. Get arrested. So I would like somebody to call this station, 508-866-1019, and tell me how I should act with women, please. All right, that's enough of that. Chief, I want to reintroduce you to the people. I know they know you. Uh, if they don't, they're missing a great bet. He's a great guy. And he's always open to anybody that wants to see him. I'm sure of that. Am I right? You are. Yeah. No. I feel there's an obligation, not an obligation, but there's a, a duty in this in my office to be accessible to the public at all times, um, to, an to just answer questions, to listen to suggestions, to take complaints if necessary. But one of the one of the best um, things that I get to do by doing so is I, I seem to be inundated by the compliments that we receive for our department and for its professionalism. Um, which is which is fantastic and uh, is definitely pleasing to hear. But as I said before, I believe that the the office and myself being in this office uh, owe the public the ability to um, interact with me whenever they need to. You know how I feel about public safety people, police I and fire. I uh, I would do anything for them at any time they ask me to. Um, and we thank you for that support, Ken. Well, you know I think that that the feeling in this town. I hear nothing but good things about the police in this town. Um, have we ever discussed the origin of an organized police force and where it came from? Not on the show, no. No. Uh, you know it was, organ it was done in England uh, yeah. last century or the century before yes. by a guy by the name of Robert Peel. I do. Which is why they call him Bobbies. He was yes. Robert. And he designed that crazy hat they wear. To and this day that they wear? <laughs> he, they called them constables then. They didn't call them police. And the word cop comes from that constable on patrol. Yes. So with that little organization that he had over there in England, we've developed a police force around the world, especially in this country, and especially the ones I know. I think they are... Uh, I go down to the waterfront quite a bit. A police officer down there on a bicycle came riding over to me. He, he sees my, me and my dog. My dog's always there. And he uh, 
started talking with me. And I was smoking a cigar. And he said, gee, that smells good. I said, well, would you like one? He said, no, no, uh, I can't smoke a cigar. And he told me why. I didn't know that. I didn't know that police cannot smoke, even at home. That's true. Uh, police officer in Massachusetts, uh, who's hired after a certain date in 1988, I believe it is, um, because we are subject to what's known as the heart bill, meaning that if you have a heart-related heart attack or hypertension, it's a, it's a means to a retirement uh, because of that, because the, the society has decided that, um, that this job may bring on hypertension or, or heart attacks and is willing to um, allow for a disability retirement based on it, you have to sign on that you won't smoke cigarettes that because of their length. Right. Yes. Yep. It's, a, it's a matter of fact, it's, it's mass law, and if you are found smoking, you, 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 it's mandatory that be, you be fired from the job. Immediate dismissal? Yes. Wow. Yep. It's, uh, it's one of the things that we sign on to when we start, and it's, like I said, it, it comes from the fact that, that since we've agreed that, that if you um, get hypertension or you have a heart attack, um, that you could p apply for disability retirement, um, part of that is to try to avoid having a heart attack or having hypertension, and since there's a link in smoking and, and uh, those illnesses. There's no question about that. Right. Um, it's not an, is it an infringement on his civil liberties? Well, no, I mean, you don't, you, you, we, all, we all have civil liberties, we all have civil rights, um, and as a police officer, you lay aside a, a few of those to have the job. So you, you, you could decide you want to smoke, you just can't, you don't have a right to have the job, so um, you have to make a choice. Uh, and it's a choice based on, you know, I, I, I guess we don't want government telling us what to do or what not to do, but certainly government does. And it, this is a choice based on uh, proven science that shows that cigarette smoking can lead to hypertension and heart disease. And if we're going to be offered a, uh, a benefit, um, potentially if that happens to you, then you've got you to gotta kind of work with the, with the state to accomplish that. So that's the reason why. Okay. Good. And it's something we sign off. Every every new police officer signs off on that when they get hired. There's a, there's a when was this law form. passed? Did you say 1988? I believe it was 1988. Is it grandfathered? Anybody prior? Anybody prior didn't could smoke. Yes, but you know. So if if you were hired prior to that date, and I and I don't don't quote me on the date. I wasn't prepared to to discuss that date today. But it's it's around 1988 that it, that it okay. came into play. Okay. That's very interesting. Yeah. And uh, they're very they're very adamant about that too. Oh right? yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, we're going we're gonna to take a break here in just a few seconds. And uh, when we come back, I'm going to ask the chief about uh, certain things uh, pertaining to uh, the drug situation in the town of Carver and in the state of Massachusetts and in the country of the United States and the rest of the world. I don't expect to answer all that. We'll just deal with Carver. But so don't go away. We'll be right back. Okay, we're back, and we're back with uh, Chief Dufley, um, Chief of the Kama Police Department. And I, I gotta ask you, Chief, uh, I notice when I go by the old fire department, there's a car out there with the police department insignia on it in pink. Yes. Is that have any significance? It certainly does. Carver Police Department, along with many of the local area departments, have joined into what's called the Pink Patch, pink patch Project. We have a patch on our uniform that we changed over to a pink for the month of October. Uh, and we, we had that cruiser uh, lettered, Signs by Design, uh, did it uh, as a donation in pink in recognition of Breast, Care, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So um, we're selling the patches. Last year we sold hats. This year we're selling the patches for $10 a piece to make donation to um, uh, breast ca cancer uh, research. You're selling these patches? Yes. Yep. You can buy them at the, stop by uh, the uh, dispatcher during the day, or any any time actually. I didn't know desk. that. Yeah, we have this is for the entire month of October. Yes, and we're we're everything that we're raising, all all the profit from that is going directly to breast can cancer research. Oh boy, you know, he, you just threw me off the track here. You know that? Yeah, I think that is. I think that's incredible. That's wonderful. It's. Uh, is this something new? Is this the first year for this? No, uh, last year we sold hats with a pink badge. Um, it was an idea that uh, came to me to my attention through our police union. Uh, several of the officers involved in the union decided that there was a uh, um, 
charity that they wanted to get involved with, uh, a cause that they wanted to get involved with. And so we authorized last year the creation of some uh, baseball hats with a pink badge on them. And this year we went, um, many, many local departments are doing it, the, the pink patch. So we changed over our patch That's to be pink in color. And That's the officers are allowed idea. to wear it on the uniform for the month of October. That's a great idea. Such sure. a worthy cause. Sure. No, it is. What we a great, so. my sister-in-law, her name was Mel. And that's a whole other story, by the way. She died of breast cancer. But she, she was an airline stewardess, and she used to go to Turkey a lot. And she saw some bracelets there, make a long story short. She bought a couple of dozen of them, brought them home, and sold them for $10 a piece. And the money, she paid only a buck for them. And the money that was excess went to breast cancer research. And uh, it became famous. She's, she's done millions of dollars, even after her death. Her family has taken it over, and they still collect really? money for this. So if somebody wants to buy a patch after October, is that possible? We, we have a limited supply of them, so that is t once we run out, we'll, we'll be out of them. But once yes, you're out, yeah, you're yeah, out. They're, they're at the front desk at the police station now, and it's just $10 a piece. So I would plead with you, anybody that's listening out there, I would plead with you to go down and buy one of these patches because that's such a great, great cause. And uh, I, I don't know what else to say. But just, just do it. It's not a lot of money, but it certainly is, means a lot to those who've got breast cancer. That's a, that's a great thing. Thank you for bringing that up. No, thank you for, uh, for letting me talk about it. And, and, and I, I want to express my gratitude to the Kava Police Union for their efforts in doing this, because it is a worthy cause. And um, without their help and their um, drive to move it forward, it'd be difficult to get, it, you know, get all this accomplished. So. Good for you. Thank Good you. for you. That, um, I want to switch the subject a little bit sure. and get a little kind of serious. Uh, I don't know if you saw 60 Minutes Sunday night. No, I didn't. Okay. It was about um, the opioid sure. problem uh, in this country, in this world, I guess. Um, make, make a long story short here. The uh, guy that was the head of the DEA in Washington um, came out with a bill. He, he taught Congress into promoting this bill, and they passed it uh, that you could no longer press charges against the pharmaceutical countries or the chain drug stores or even though in, in the 60 Minutes pointed out that a little town like Carver, for example, this, they didn't say Carver, mm -hmm. a little town like Carver all of a sudden gets 100,000 pills shipped in by a pharmaceutical company. And the guy that, that is the whistleblower here wanted to know why, and they told him to lay off. And he went from supervising 600 people to zero. Mm -hmm. He finally resigned. Anyway, uh, it looks like a big scandal is about to brew. But how, how is this? You know, there's over 250,000 people who have died from overdoses now in mm -hmm. the country. This How's it doing, Carver? How are, we, how are we doing with that? Well, we're on track this year to be currently slightly under what we were last year for overdoses and for overdose deaths, which is a good thing. That's good. Um, we are uh, part of the Plymouth County Out Outreach Program, which is a collaboration with all 27, uh, well, one city in all in 26 towns, Brockton and all the 26 towns. We started it with Plymouth, Carver, and Middleborough, and it's expanded to the entire county. The district attorney's office is involved, and so is the sheriff's department. And that program um, tracks overdoses and wherever they happen and offers, goes out the next day with a police officer and a clinician to offer help to the person who overdosed, and then also to offer help to family members who are also dealing with the, the problem of having a, a family member who's addicted. Um, we've had uh, huge success in, in getting people into programs to, to help them get started in the process of, uh, of trying to, uh, to beat the addiction. Um, we've been, I think, been very helpful with a lot of the families. I know we've got a lot of positive feedback from moms and dads who have contacted me to, to thank us for our help in that. And I think taking a different, law enforcement taking a different approach um, than traditional law enforcement is just arresting people and, and going out and trying to offer help and offer other solutions to this problem, I think, are the way we're going to impact that. I don't know that it'll be the, the, the fix, but I th certainly think that it requires us to change our mindset, and we've been doing that over the past few years, about our role in this and, and waiting for other people to step in and do what has not worked. So we've we made those connections with other, uh, with you know, health, uh, providers for, of um, the hospitals and the, the um, high points, the Gosnells, the places out there that, that provide help for people suffering addiction. And by combining that and getting past HIPAA and getting past the, the, the way things used to be done, 
we're going out and seeking the people who are suffering from the addiction and offering the help that we think that they need to, to, to deal with that. In the okay. past, we've, we've put people in jail who've been suffering from an addiction, and while I think that you know, you, you can have different opinions on whether that works or not, putting them in jail certainly takes them off the street for a period of time, but it doesn't do anything to, to affect the, the actual addiction that's causing the problem. You know, somebody who's addicted to drugs and can't get the money to will break into somebody's house or into somebody's car to do that. And they've committed a crime and we should deal with that, but the underlying cause is the addiction and we need to deal with that appropriately too. Um, so we've changed how we look at it, the world's changed how they look at, at addiction, and I think it's the right thing to be doing. I think yeah. you've got to combine that approach with better education for young people so they don't make the, 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 the um, choices in the first place and, and tough law enforcement for the people who are actually dealing in, in these substances, whether it be pills or whether it be heroin or fentanyl or anything. You've got to, you've got to deal with those two, but I think the, the missing component has always been trying to provide the assistance, the proper assistance to somebody who's suffering an addiction because while I think that people should be held accountable, I also think that they need to be given the, the tools that they need to try to overcome an addiction because it can be a pretty harrowing experience, especially for the person and for the whole family. So we're, we're I'm happy to be part of that and, and be working with trying to make things better. Um, yeah, you. I, I think you're right. I think there are a lot of a lot of the uh, pharmaceutical companies um, probably have a lot of um, influence among the lobbyists in, in Washington D.C. to keep their to keep their system going. But I think that they owe um, something to this problem too, because we've be, we you know we, we, from my understanding, I don't know the stats, but as a country. We consume the large portion of prescription medications f throughout the world, so yeah. we have a heavy reliance on pres prescription medications in our in our healthcare industry, and and I think you're seeing that change. I mean, when I go to the doctor now, they they talk about different alternatives to any type of medication like that, and I think that that's where we need to be going because that certainly is a, a portion of this problem. Yeah, you know, you you talk about um, not arresting somebody. When, now that I understand that, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. But before, yeah, get them off the street. Get mm -hmm. them up. But they're sick people. They just, they should have medical care or mental care or whatever. And don't don't take me don't don't take my words wrong. I, I I do believe in accountability. So does the Plymouth County Outreach Program. And we definitely need to be hold, hold, holding people criminal accountable for selling uh, right. these things. Even right. even some of the people who are selling are selling it to 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 forward their own addiction. But but we need to hold these people accountable. And we should hold the people who are suffering from addiction accountable for their actions, like you and I are held accountable for ours. But if putting them in jail doesn't help to treat that addiction, then we're really, if we really want to stop the problem, we're not, that's not going to stop the problem. Yeah. We can do it and think, okay, well, they're away and they're gone and I don't have to deal with that, but then they get out of jail and they're still suffering that addiction. Yeah. So hold them accountable is fine as long as you're also offering them some kind of help to get past the addiction because you can't, it's, it's, a, it's a cycle and you're not going to break it unless you yeah. offer some help to get rid of the addiction. Is, is there a, is, if, if an addict, uh, addict is held in jail for like 30 days, could he come out cured? No, I, not in my, not in my I'm, again, I'm not a medical professional, but for what I've seen, you need a good long-term commitment to, to probably a year or two before you really wow. get to a point. And I don't wow. think they can ever, ever considered cured. I think that you're always um, considered having the addiction, but you have it you know, kind of yeah. like in remission. I don't know what the right term would be. But it's always there. It's always a, a something to be dealt with. There. And we, we owe it to the people who have that to give them the tools and the ability to try to get past that. And sometimes but, it takes more than one try. But isn't it always there for, for even you or I? I've never tried drugs. I'm sure you haven't. But isn't it there? We, it's, it's a choice. Well, I'm not a medical expert, but I believe I, you're right. We get people get into addiction many times by a choice or, or, or by not. I mean, some people have been prescribed a prescription medication that they followed their prescription and ended up addicted to the yeah, pills, and then, no and then that can that can elude that can as yeah. as you can't get the prescription pills anymore that can move into a heroin addiction. Yeah. So there are many ways to come to an addic addiction, and certainly some are by bad choices, and that's why I, I talk about education of young people and helping them to avoid making some of those bad choices to to prevent that. Um, but at the end of the day, when we're dealing with an addicted person and their family, it really doesn't matter how they got there. It matters that they're here and, then, That's and right. they, they cannot. That's right. You're right. We, we've, a, we've, we've proven through science that they can't just through sheer willpower alone fix that problem. Right. So we can, if we want to get mad at the person and say, well, you made bad choices and we don't care. We can say that, but it doesn't help to resolve the problem. No. It, it, the problem still exists. Yeah. And yeah. we would be remiss in, in not doing that. Yeah, we, can, we can be upset by, you know, it's, it's kind of like a loved one can make you mad by their choices, but you still love them. Well, we can be upset by the choices, but now we've got to find a, a compassionate way to deal with the problem. And that's a great, that's a great way to feel about it. I, I know about alcoholism. Mm -hmm. Not personally, but I've lived with it. My father was an alcoholic. And 
even though he stopped drinking, he's still a recovering alcoholic. Right. He's still a recovering addict. What is, what is the age of these people that are overdosed, that are dying? Are they children? Are they kids? Well, I, we honestly, we've seen uh, everything from, from teenage children to, to 60 year old people. Wow. See, that's it, right. It runs the gamut. It's yeah, not that's a, right. that's the, right. the addiction and the disease is not, um, does not discriminate based on age or, or, or size or, or gender or any of those things. It, it finds its way into um, a, lot of, a lot of different people. We just did a vigil with, um, I'm sorry, we did a vigil with Carver Kias uh, a little while ago and, and um, displayed uh, pictures on the, on the screen in the, in the high school of people who had, who had uh, lost their fight with the addiction. And um, those pictures showed run the gamut of the people in society. They're everybody that's out there. You yeah. know what I mean, they are. They look like your neighbors. They look like your nephews and your your nieces. And uh, you um, can't tell you can't tell who it is. You can't tell who it is. It's just a shame. It, uh, the kids, you know, you tell them don't smoke cigarettes. And I still see kids out in the street smoking cigarettes mm -hmm. after all the information they've got that it'll kill them. And to t imagine to, to take a young mind and alter it with a drug that you can never give up. It's that monkey on your back over and over. You mentioned fentanyl. Mm -hmm. Is that something new? Something, no, it's not really something new. It's just something we're seeing more of. They, you know, I understand that a grain of that can kill you. Well, a grain of car fentanyl, which is uh, there's heroin, then there's fentanyl, and the car fentanyl, and um, there is, you know, as you as you as the potency in car fentanyl is much more potent than fentanyl, and much more potent than heroin. As you get, as you deal with substances like that, certainly if you're not, if you, you know, somebody who's not um, using it all the time or whatever, does come in contact with it, could have very serious ramifications wow. on their health. Um, I don't know. About, I mean, I've seen the, the the pictures, the showing of grain of it next to a penny that say that it'll kill you. Yeah. Um, I. I I don't know the, the reality of that, okay. but it is certainly a, a very dangerous. We take all precautions. We've we stopped um, doing any field testing um, and having the testing done only in a lab so we don't expose our officers to it if we don't have to. One quick question because our time is running out. Sure. Which, uh, should every civilian, uh, in other words, a non-police carry this overdose, it's life-saving thing? I think what Narcan? Yeah. Yes. Well, all of our officers do, all of, uh, all of the paramedics and the EMTs do. Should um, we? Many fire departments. A lot of people are, um, a lot, especially people who have family members or who have addictions. There's talk about putting uh, Narcan doses out in the public in lock boxes, so if you call 911, they could tell you where it was and they could, you could get it. Certainly, it, it has the ability to reverse uh, a, a, you know, a potential life-threatening uh, problem yeah. so it yeah. certainly is good to have it out there just like it's good to you know, I mean but at the same token we should probably have epi pens out there more often in AEDs and we, we've done as a society when we deal with public health things become we've come in full circle we've, we've added more and more um, tools to the toolbox and we should have them available as best we can you know okay. AEDs are in every mall you see so yeah all right uh, I'm I, well, I could go another. it's 30 minutes or up already I can't believe it I could go another hour with this guy I've got millions of questions but you're coming back sometime? Certainly. Every once in a while we get the chief in here because if give an update to the town. And uh, to be honest with you, I just like talking to a guy like this. <laughs> you know, he's part of our public safety and we are lucky to have him. All right, uh, chief, is there anything you'd like to say to the people before we wind it up? No, just thank you again, Ken, for the opportunity to come before you and oh, answer thank some you questions. Thank so you for being here. I just told you before, I, I need to be out there for the public, and I also think uh, helping the public understand what we do is, a, is an important thing. So Absolutely. Any chance I can to answer any of your questions, I'm happy to do so. Absolutely. Thank you for a great police force. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're going to sign off. I hope you got as much out of this as I did. We're going to ask some more questions the next time he comes back. So for that reason alone, Keep tuned to this station, Channel 13. Tell your friends and relatives about it. Tell them what we do. Tell them what they do. And don't forget to buy the pink patch. Ten bucks. Carver Police Station. Go in there. They're welcome you with open arms. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate it. And until next time, keep a song in your heart. God bless and good night.